Hi, my name is Christine Passarelli, and I'm a holistic nurse, and I work in cardiac rehab here at Doylestown Hospital. Today, I'm going to talk about a holistic approach to stress management. The human body is the physician of its own illness. I love to open with this quote from Hippocrates because he has long been considered the father of modern medicine. As long ago as he lived, Hippocrates knew and understood that our bodies know how to heal themselves. And that's what we're trying to do, support and encourage our bodies to heal themselves. So how do we do this? Well, one way is by utilizing a holistic approach. And what does a holistic rep approach refer to? According to the American Holistic Nursing Association, holism views that our body, mind, and spirit are inseparable and interrelated, each affecting the other. So our goal is to promote health and wellness of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. So here are some questions you can reflect on to determine if you can better promote health and wellness in your own body, mind, or spirit. Our well-being comes from the interconnectedness and balance of these three aspects of our lives. The wonderful thing about this is that when we create health in one area of our life, the positive effects spill into the other areas. So what is stress? Well, according to Psychology Today, stress generally refers to the psychological perception of pressure and the body's response to it. So let's look at an example of this. Here we have some deer who are hanging out, curious about the photographer in the distance. Well, what happens when they sense real danger? That's right, they run for their lives. Why? Well, because they want to survive. So you're seeing their flight or fight or flight system in action. What is this fight or flight system? It's stimulation or activation of the sympathetic nervous system. It's the body's response to stress. When danger is sensed, adrenaline and cortisol, which are chemicals in the brain, are released. And these turn on what we need to survive. Like it increases our heart rate, our blood pressure is increased, we breathe faster, our senses get sharpened, and we get a burst of energy. But it also turns off the things that we don't need. So like our digestion and our immune response. So now that the threat is gone, the deer have returned to rest and relaxation. No worries here. Well, in the world of animals. But in the world of humans, it's a slightly different scenario. You see, humans not only respond to actual danger, but we can also trigger our own stress response by seeing, feeling, touching, or thinking about stressful events from our past. Let me say that again. Humans can activate our stress response by reliving our stressful events, and we can do it over and over again. Well, this is where the problem lies. We are not only recreating the memory, but we are recreating every feeling associated with that event. An extreme example of this is a person who suffers from PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Wouldn't it be great to be like the animals? The event is gone and so are the thoughts and stress associated with it. We move on. But since we're not like animals, the goal in holistic stress management is to improve our response and decrease the level of response. So is this you? Or is this you? Or is this you? Are you like the duck? You look calm, just gliding along, but in reality, the feet are moving really quickly in the water. So what actually is happening is you might appear calm on the outside, but on the inside, you're completely stressed out. So you may be asking, why is decreasing stress important? Well, because with a prolonged or ongoing stress, the body's flight or fight system does not shut off. Thus, it becomes chronic. And when stress response is chronic, it's like our bodies are always on a heightened alert. Physiologically, this causes dysfunction of the blood vessels, increases our inflammatory response, and increases the release of free radicals. All of these changes can contribute to the risk for chronic diseases like high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and autoimmune illnesses such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And when you're feeling stress, these are some of the things you may be experiencing. 
You might feel headaches. You might feel fatigued, more irritable. You may worry more, feel indecisive, apathetic, and even depressed. You may notice now that you're overeating, and it's not the good stuff. It's probably more sweets, carbs, or junk food. You're probably exercising less, and if you smoke, it's more. Your caffeine intake goes up, and you're drinking more alcohol. None of this is good for you in the long run, nor does it feel good. Ah, but these guys are the ultimate cool dudes. If we're like them, cool, calm, and collected, either we have no stress, which isn't likely, or we engage in stress reduction activities. And if we engage in stress reduction activities on a regular basis, then we become resilient to the effects of stress, like these two. So now let's look at how we could be more like Snoopy and Woodstock. Ways to reduce stress, or as I like to say, ways to build resiliency. What is resiliency? According to Webster's, it's the ability to recover or adjust quickly to difficulties, misfortune, or change. The body, mind, and spirit become more resilient when you engage in stress reduction activities and activities that you enjoy. These activities activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So let's review. The autonomic nervous system has two parts. The sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight response, which we just discussed, and the parasympathetic, which allows for deactivation, or it's our rest, repair, and healing system. The sympathetic and parasympathetics cannot work at the same time. It's one or the other. Therefore, the more you can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, it keeps the sympathetic nervous system off. And when we can do this, we can reduce our stress and build our resiliency. Ways to build resiliency. Just changing the word from stress management to building resiliency also shifts our way of thinking. So let's look at five ways to create that shift. First is exercise. Well, why exercise? Because exercise causes the release of endorphins, which create a sense of well-being and happiness. Forms of aerobic exercise include brisk walking, running, cycling, and swimming. According to the American Heart Association, we should get between 150 to 300 minutes of aerobic exercise per week. What that breaks down into is 30 to 60 minutes, five days a week. Moderate intensity exercise, which means that you're taking a breath about every three to four words. But for those of you who exercise at a higher intensity, all you need is 35 minutes, three days a week to achieve the same benefits. Now, for those of you who cannot do 15 minutes of even moderate intensity exercise due to other conditions like some orthopedic issues, then try to be as physically active as possible. One way to track that is by counting steps. And the goal is to reach 8,000 to 10,000 steps per day. Having an active lifestyle is important even when you get the recommended amount of aerobic exercise. They actually go hand in hand. And along with that, is resistance exercise because that can also release the endorphins in our body. So I was talking about brisk walking. Well, here you go. When you go for a walk, go with friends. It's so important to maintain your social, social network and it also helps to diminish your feelings of stress. This is a picture of me and my two coworkers participating in the Walk with the Doc event, which is held on the third Wednesday of every month here at Doylestown Hospital. Oh yeah, that's me in the middle. So let's talk about what to eat. Think back to the slide on physiologic changes. Inflammation of the blood vessels occur due to prolonged stress response, which creates an environment that can lead to increased plaque. Well, eating healthy is one way to counteract that. So these are your anti-inflammatory foods, some of which need to be a part of your everyday diet. So look at the stuff that you might like to eat. So whether it's salmon, grass-fed beef, walnuts, avocado, almonds, olive oil, quinoa, chia seeds, some of these need to be a part of your everyday diet. But these are the things that you don't want to eat. These are the foods that promote inflammation. And we all know what they are. They're the junk foods, it's the soda, high sugar things, corn syrup is in just so many processed foods and it's something you really don't want to be eating. 
red meats, processed meats, highly processed white foods, and frying your foods. Additionally, you want to limit the omega-6s, which means overall all meats, dairy, eggs, soybeans, and corn oils, less trans fat and saturated fats. And when I mean the meat, I mean just limit it. It doesn't mean that you have to stop eating meat. In addition to exercise and healthy eating, adequate sleep is an important factor in managing your stress, since during sleep is when the body, mind, and spirit are healing. The National Sleep Foundation states that seven to nine hours of sleep is optimal for, m for most people. You can promote better sleep by drinking less caffeine or eliminating it completely. Limit the amount of alcohol you drink and reducing the amount of naps you take during the day. If you decrease your intake of fluids approximately three hours prior to bedtime, it will limit the amount of times that you wake during the night to empty your bladder. Then practice relaxation techniques such as deep breathing, listening to music, or listening to guided meditation. Any one of these can also help your body and mind to relax so you can fall asleep faster. Next, let's talk about positivity. We all know that people we surround ourselves with affects us and how we feel. The negative person can bring us down and the happy positive person can brighten our day. But why wait for somebody else's positivity to rub off on us? Let's do it ourselves. And we can do that by surrounding ourselves with people who are happy. We can also let go of things we can't control. One of the things that can help that is by reading the serenity prayer. It reminds us of the things that we can't, that are, are not in our control. And the things that are in control, well then, let's do something about them. Like saying no to the things that will add stress to our lives. And when we do say no, don't feel guilty about it. Another thing we can do is use positive affirmations. And what that means is saying positive things to ourselves. So you can actually find a saying or a mantra that you find uplifting. And when you find that, repeat it to yourself throughout the day and notice how it improves the way you feel about yourself. Also, by changing our ne negative self-talk. We, we don't talk to our friends. I'm sorry I'm laughing because it's so true. We don't talk to our friends the way we sometimes talk to ourselves. And that can be so negative. So instead of discouraging ourselves, encourage ourselves. Forgive ourselves for our mistakes. We're human. Support yourself. Be your own cheerleader. It's amazing what changing a few words can do to our perspective and improve our sense of well-being. And then, of course, engage in gratitude. In recent years, there have been so many studies on the, the positive effects of gratitude. Come up with your own gratitude ritual, whether you're saying the same sentence every morning or writing down two things that you're grateful for every day. Either way, notice how it improves the way you feel. Now I'm going to talk about some approaches you may not be so familiar with. Mind-body approaches. They engage both the body and the mind by actively changing the manner in which you respond to environmental and internal stressors. By changing your response, you can, response, you can decrease your stress response and build resiliency. The mind-body approaches engage the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, I'm going to repeat myself because this is important. The autonomic nervous system has two parts, the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic, which allows for our rest and relaxation and promotes healing. The parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system cannot work at the same time. It's one or the other. So let's engage the parasympathetic nervous system more often to encourage that relaxation response. So now let's look at some specific mind-body approaches that can help you to do this. First, we have deep breathing. Well, we all know that taking a deep breath helps us to relax, but why? Because deep breathing activities activate the, ner the vagus nerve, which causes a parasympathetic response. Deep breathing can be done anywhere. Just sit and take 10 slow, deep breaths, being careful not to breathe too fast because we don't want you to hy hyperventilate. So while we're sitting here, let's take one deep breath now. Breathe in and release it slowly. When you do this throughout the day, it retrains your body-mind 
changing how you respond to stress. Another mind-body approach is progressive muscle relaxation. And what this is, is alternating tightening and relaxing one muscle group at a time in conjunction with taking slow, deep breaths. Most people begin at the head and work your way down the body towards your toes. This practice can be done almost anywhere. All you need is a place where you can close your eyes, take some deep breaths, and focus. You can also do this while listening to music. Mindfulness. John Kabat-Zinn created the mindfulness-based stress reduction program in the 1960s. It focuses on alleviating pain and improving physical and emotional well-being through moment-to-moment non-judgmental awareness of ourselves. And this is done by learning how to pay attention to this moment in time without judging yourself. You're becoming aware. And once we can become aware, we can change how we respond to stress. Let's talk about meditation, as it is by far the most widely recognized mind-body approach because it's been around a very long time and because of its proven effectiveness. It's a practice that helps the mind-body disconnect from its internal chatter. It helps to create a sense of relaxation, calm, and an internal healing environment on all levels. Meditation combines focusing on the breath while reducing awareness and thought about what's going on around you. If you practice daily, over time, new pattern in the brain is created and take roots. This is called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is important because it's this new pattern in the brain which makes you more resilient to the effects of stress. The same stress might be going on around you but you and your body do not respond as quickly or in the same manner as it would have previously. What a benefit. Let's review the many different types of meditation that there are. I encourage you to find one that's most comfortable for you. First, there's the traditional seated meditation, which you can do either sitting on the floor or on a chair. And then there are the moving meditations. When you're moving, you can be either inside or out. And the third type of meditation is prayer. Whether it's formal or informal, prayer is a spiritual exercise that allows people to communicate with their God or belief system. With prayer, we have a belief that there is a power greater than ourselves and faith that this power is looking out for us. This belief creates a sense of calm within. So let's examine more closely what the seated and moving meditative exercises are. First, we have transcendental meditation. This meditation is the practice that gained popularity in the 1960s when the Beatles went to India and trained with Maharishi. It's a silent meditation that is practiced twice a day for 20 minutes while sitting with your eyes closed, saying a mantra. And a mantra is a phrase that is repeated over and over to aid in your concentration. Then there's guided meditation. This is a meditation where guidance is provided by a trained practitioner either through verbal instruction, audio, or audiovisual. There are many apps available on smartphones that you can use. My favorite happens to be Insight Timer, which I recommend to our cardiac rehab patients all the time. You can choose from a variety of meditations and you can choose what you would like the meditation to focus on. Mindfulness meditation is a meditation of awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. It expands your happiness by enhancing self-knowledge and understanding. Now loving kindness, it's a type of meditation where we mentally send goodwill, kindness, and warmth to ourselves and others by repeating a series of traditional phrases. Loving kindness is actually a Buddhist tradition. It's directed at teaching, at teaching us and to cultivate our propensity for kindness, compassion, and love, and that love is toward ourselves and all people. You can use three to five phrases, and these phrases can be said either silently or aloud. A few examples of phrases that are typically used are, may I be happy, may I be safe, may I be free from suffering, may I be well and strong, may I be filled with compassion and loving kindness. These same phrases are repeated, directing the phrase toward specific people 
or all people. So you can look online for phrases that feel right to you and create your own loving kindness practice. Now let's talk about the different types of moving meditation, which is meditation involving your physical movement. In yoga, the poses are held for a period of time, whereas in Tai Chi, the poses are not held, but they're a series of continuous, slow, gentle movements that are typically patterned after movements found in nature. Qigong is the focus on the breath first and then on the patterned movement. And then there's labyrinth walking. And what that is, is walking slowly while following a circular path, which quiets your mind, gives you an environment to reflect and to center yourself. While you're doing this, you can focus on a spiritual question or a prayer. We're actually lucky enough to have a labyrinth in the center of Doylestown, located on Pine Street near the library. And there's a second one in Sellersville on Park Avenue beside the National Guard Armory. Oddly enough, another type of mind-body approach which helps to manage stress and build, re build resiliency. Yeah, you say that three times fast. Um, anyway, it's laughter. And that's because laughter relaxes muscles. It produces the feel-good hormones called endorphins. It boosts our immunity and it lowers our stress hormone. And even better yet, it makes more sense that laughing with others produces more powerful effects than laughing alone. There's also laughter yoga. Um, have you ever tried it? There's practitioners that specialize it in Doylestown. And along with that is pet therapy. So it's been proven that being with animals, whether it's your own pet or whether it's somebody else's, um, it significantly reduces emotional distress. It really doesn't matter what kind of animal it is. They all provide the same benefit. It can be your cat or your dog, a bunny, a horse. It's the reason we have certified therapy dogs and we have them visit our patients here at Doylestown Hospital. There's two more mind-body approaches um, that I'd like to talk about and that's nature therapy and art therapy. Nature therapy can be as formal as going with a, a guide, going for a walk with a guide, walking in the forest, and paying attention to nature. It's actually called forest bathing now. <laughs> or it can be as informal as sitting in your flower garden, smelling the sense of the nature around you. And art therapy can be as formal as working with a specialist who guides you through the creative process, or as informal as getting together with friends to color, paint, or draw. A study in 2006 shows that art therapy reduced depression, anxiety, and assisted in treatment of addictions and trauma. So now let's move on to complementary therapies. Complementary or integrative therapies are non-medical therapies that support your body's innate ability to heal. These therapies are used alongside medical therapy. According to the National Institutes of Health, a survey that they did in 2012, 58% of the 65,000 adults who were surveyed used some form of complementary therapy to maintain or improve one's health and wellness. And they've found that that number has continued to grow. So let's look at some specific complementary therapies. So the first one is massage. We are, uh, most people are very familiar with massage and we know that it's a hands-on technique that increases circulation to our muscles, relieving tension in the muscles and creating a sense of relaxation. If you've ever experienced a massage, you know how good it is and how, make, how it makes you feel so relaxed. I continuously recommend massage therapy for people um, due to the benefits. And it really truly helps our, um, our cardiac patients to reduce the amount of stress that they're feeling. Another therapy or complementary therapy is acupuncture. And acupuncture is a traditional Chinese medicine practice that originated thousands of years ago. It's based on the premise that a blockage or disturbance in the body's flow of life energy, which is also called qi, can cause health issues. An acupuncturist inserts hair-thin needles to specific acupuncture points throughout the body to restore that flow of qi, to balance the body's energy, to stimulate healing, and to promote relaxation. There are over a thousand acupuncture points on the body, 
each lying on an invisible energy, energy channel, which is called a meridian. Studies have shown multiple health benefits, including promoting relaxation and reduced feelings of stress when acupuncture is used. And the last thing we have is energy therapy or energy healing, which is a holistic practice that activate, activates the body's subtle energy systems to remove blocks. By breaking through these energetic blocks, the body's natural ability to heal itself is stimulated. Some energy therapies you may be familiar with are healing touch, therapeutic touch, Reiki, or body talk. There are many other complementary therapies, some of which I've listed here, which are available to help you feel less stress and to feel better overall. Additionally, getting involved with things that you enjoy, whether it's some form of exercise, taking a class, volunteering, or becoming involved in your religious or spiritual community is also a way of building resiliency. As we've just reviewed, there's so many approaches and modalities available to relieve stress and build resiliency, but the most important element is finding what works for you. So let's recap. Your health and wellness is a multifaceted approach. Your body, mind, and spirit know how to heal naturally, and you can support your healing by using a holistic approach. Exercising, eat well, sleep well, engage in mind, body, and complementary therapies, and activities that reduce your stress, thus boosting your resiliency. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find me in the cardiac rehab department at Doylestown Hospital.